Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to the Leitner Observatory and Planetarium Tuesday night, public night. Yes, it's Tuesday night once again, and although the observatory is closed and Yale campus is closed, uh, I'm trying to do a live stream on Tuesday nights, uh, showing what's up in the sky, talking a little bit about astronomy news, um, taking questions. If anyone has any questions, feel free to post them in the YouTube live chat and I will be happy to answer all the questions that I see. Uh, I also have a planetarium show tonight, so I'm gonna show a, a show about Venus and the Earth and why Venus is different from the Earth in terms of its climate. Talk a little bit about that, happy to take questions uh, about that as well. On Tuesday nights, I'm also gonna do um, live streaming, live video and imaging through a telescope when it's clear. Uh, and it's fairly cloudy today in New Haven. It was a beautiful day, uh, a little crisp, uh, partly sunny, uh, and it's gotten cloudy tonight. So no telescope viewing tonight. You can see here the live view from the observatory deck uh, that I've been watching to see if it, uh, if it clears up. Uh, but no telescopes uh, tonight, maybe next week. I'm gonna keep trying to do this every Tuesday night and uh, look at something interesting through the telescopes on Tuesday nights when it's clear. Well, since it's cloudy, I'm going to switch over to my sky simulator here and talk a bit about what's up in the sky this week. So let me switch over to my simulator and my face cam. All right, hello everyone. Okay, so here I am in Stellarium yet again. Uh, this is free software that you can download from stellarium.org. Uh, planetarium simulation software that lets you simulate the sky from any location, um, any time of night or day, any date of the year. So um, do a, I'll do a couple of different things with Stellarium today than I've done in the past, but I'm seeing the sun just going below the horizon uh, tonight uh, as seen from New Haven and no stars are popping out in the simulator just yet. So let's go a little bit forward in time and see what stars are gonna pop out. So I'm running time forward. You can see the time stamp down here. There we go. And there's Venus. There's Venus popping out just behind the tree there. And also behind the tree, you can see the planet Mercury. So if I actually go a little bit back in time, there is the planet Mercury just a little bit to the west of Venus. So setting a little bit before Venus. So not really uh, visible yet. So I'll go a little bit later when Venus comes out. There it is. I think we're gonna have to say uh, goodbye to Venus now. Uh, we had a nice view of it through the telescope last week and then two weeks before that. And uh, Venus is heading between the Earth and the Sun in its orbit, and so we're gonna lose it. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about Venus's motion um, here in a minute, but uh, I think this is gonna be the last chance to see Venus. If you have a clear view of the Western horizon right at sunset, you might catch it one night this week right when the sun goes down. Let's uh, go to later in the evening when some more stars will come out. There we go. By the way, uh, you do every so often see these bright lights zip across my screen in Stellarium. Uh, those are artificial satellites. So Stellarium does have a model for some low Earth orbiting satellites. And right at um, sunset is a great time to see uh, Earth orbiting satellites if you're interested in seeing them. A lot of amateur astronomers don't want to see them <laughs> uh, because there are more and more of them all the time. And uh, people are worried they're going to ruin astrophotography and things like that. But um, I think it's kind of fun to see them, uh, especially the brighter ones like the International Space Station. Um, and I'm always amused when I see one go through the field of view of the telescope. In fact, when I was reviewing the live stream from last week, when I was looking at, um, I think it was Iota Cancri, a uh, lot with live video through the telescope, you saw a satellite go <laughs> through, the, through the image during the video at one point, which is pretty neat. The simulator, um, I don't know if it has the most accurate orbits for these satellites, so they may or may not be accurate in terms of, would you really see that satellite at that place? Um, in the sky when you when you are observing at that time. Okay, so here we are at about nine o'clock. Let me label the uh, constellations for you and their names. 
Um, although I'll point out the bright stars that are out before I do that. So low in the uh, sort of northwest, you can see the yellow supergiant Capella. Um, you can see the two stars in uh, Gemini, Pollux, and Castor. The two bright stars are kind of almost uh, parallel to the horizon uh, after sunset. Um, and then the bright bluish white star Procyon is down in the west southwest right at sunset. There's the bright red star Arcturus over in the southeast. A uh, really bright star, really obvious. And of course, you can find this star using the Big Dipper. So I've shown this a couple of different times. If you use the seven bright stars in Ursa Major that make up the, the Big Dipper, the handle of the Big Dipper, we say that you, let's spin around this way. So we're facing uh, sort of east-southeast at the moment. There's the shape of the Big Dipper, which is more or less overhead at 9 p.m. this week if the sky is clear. If you follow the handle, the arc of the handle, we say that you arc to Arcturus, and if you were to continue, you would spy Spica, which is the brightest star in the constellation of Virgo. Arcturus is a bright reddish star. It's a red super, uh, red giant star, not a super giant star. Um, and so it's really, really obvious, really easy to see in the east in the spring. Whereas uh, Spica, it's not as bright, but uh, it's a bright star and it's definitely bluish white. You can see that the color difference between Arcturus and Spica is obvious, especially if you use a small telescope or just a, a pair of binoculars. And then coming up over here in the northeast at 9 p.m., we've got the bright blue star Vega, which is also uh, a burner of a star, super bright star. And in the summer, we see it more or less overhead at sunset. So easy star to find and super bright, very close to us, only about 25 light years away. So one of the brightest stars that you can see in the sky. Okay, let me label the uh, constellations that are out. And I'm gonna go even a little bit later in the evening so that we really do get some of the fainter stars popping in. And uh, I talked uh, last week and the week before about some of the constellations over here, such as Cancer and Leo. Uh, remember that you can find the stars in the Big Dipper to find Leo. Famously, you can use the two stars at the end of the cup to find uh, the North Star Polaris, right? So there's the shape of the Big Dipper, four stars in the cup, and then uh, three stars in the handle, part of the bigger constellation of the Big Bear. And yeah, I like this illustration. I kind of think of this kind of pointed part of the, the, cup, the, the star pattern as the nose of the bear. And then there are these three pairs of stars um, that you can see if the sky is dark. Uh, you can't see them in New Haven, it's the sky, there's just too much light pollution. But if you notice this little pair of stars and this little pair of stars and this little pair of stars, looks like little, little hops uh, across the sky. Uh, they're part of Ursa Major and I think of them as the claws of the bear. So you can kind of see there's the, the two back legs and the, and the two claws on his back legs and there's one of his front claws. Anyway, the two stars at the uh, end of the cup, away from the handle, if you follow them and stop at the next bright star that you see, uh, that's going to be Polaris the North Star. No matter what time of night, no matter what season of the year, it's always in the same place in the sky. It doesn't move because it's right on the axis of rotation of uh, the sky, of, of the Earth. Um, and if you use the other two stars and go the other way, so those are the pointer stars that point to Polaris, these are the two stars that we're going to follow the other way. Uh, stop when you get to a bright star. That's going to be Regulus, the brightest star in Leo the Lion. Now, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about the star clusters and double stars in Cancer. And then last week, I talked about some of the interesting uh, galaxies that you can see with telescope, uh, a telescope or binoculars in um, uh, the direction of Virgo and Leo. So uh, I want to talk about some of these other constellations over in this part of the sky and some of my favorite uh, constellations. I think this is a really interesting right here. I'll turn on the illustrations again. So we've got Leo the lion right there, part of the zodiac. There's the, the plane of the solar system going across the sky and the constellations in that plane are what we call the zodiac. So Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, and then Scorpius is coming uh, up low in the southeast there at about 10 o'clock. Um, but if we go up from Virgo, kind of to the east left, if you're facing Spica and find Arcturus, you see this constellation called, it uh, looks like Bootes, uh, Bootes. Uh, the New Yorker would put an umlaut on that second O to make it clear that there should be a, a break in the syllable. So Bootes. Uh, Bootes is the herdsman, right? 
Uh, now, if I turn off the uh, illustration, really, uh, that's the herdsman. A lot of amateur astronomers call it the kite. Yeah, it kind of looks, like, uh, looks like a kite uh, with Arcturus as the base of the kite and then a little bit of a tail coming off there to the right or to the west. Um, but the herdsman is actually herding the great bear. So if we look at where the herdsman is, and if we look at where Ursa Major is, let's zoom out a little bit. And again, if we speed up time and let time pass, you can see that the, the great bear is moving in a big circle around the North Star. Everything in the sky moves in a big circle around the North Star because it appears as though everything's rotating around the North Star. If I spin around here, and face north, you can see that the North Star is essentially stationary right there. And as the Earth rotates to the east, it appears as though the sky is turning to the west, um, and then eventually you see the sun's gonna come up over here in the east. Um, let me go back in time so I can talk a little bit more about the, the herdsmen. These are constellations you wouldn't be able to see this time of year because they're up during the daytime, those ones that are up when the sun is rising. Uh, so I'll go back a little bit in time. Okay. And here we are at sunset tonight, right? Sunset on May 19th. And watch the herdsman right here and watch the big bear. And as time passes, the herdsman is making the big bear go in a big circle uh, around the little bear, essentially, uh, where Polaris is in the constellation of Ursa Minor. Uh, some other interesting constellations over in this direction. Um, Coma Berenices is um, not a very bright constellation, although it does have some important objects in it. Like I mentioned the Coma galaxy cluster uh, last time, which is about 300 million light years away. I said, I think 100 million last time, 100 million parsecs, but uh, about 300 million uh, light years. But a little bit about the star lore of this constellation. Um, Coma is a Latin word that means hair. So this means Bernice's hair. So you see represented as a lock of hair uh, there. Now, Bernice is uh, Berenice. Ber Ber uh, Bernice is a Egyptian ruler who lived 250 something BC, uh, who famously, there's a famous Greek myth, not a myth, but a story. A lot of the uh, constellations are about Greek myths, right? About uh, Hercules, there's Hercules over there, and uh, Orion, of course, comes from a Greek myth. But uh, Berenice is a real person, uh, one of the rulers of Egypt during the Ptolemaic period. This is after Alexander the Great uh, conquers Egypt. Uh, and famously to Greeks, <laughs> she cut off her hair as an offering to the gods so that the ruler would come back from a, a famous war. So this was a constellation established sort of in Greek times, and uh, now it's been accepted as one of the classical Greek, Greek constellations. So Coma Berenice, Bernice's hair. Uh, you can't really see any of the stars <laughs> in this constellation um, from a city, from New Haven, but it is a, has a lot of important objects in it. If we look over to the left from Bootes, the herdsman, there's a cute little constellation, one of my favorite constellations in the northern sky, which is Corona Borealis. And let me hide the labels here so you just see the pattern of stars. And what do you think? Corona, Corona, it's a famous word now, right? Everyone knows what Corona means. Corona is a Latin word for crown. Um, and can you see? Yes, there's a little crown right there. Right? So this is uh, Corona Borealis, the northern crown. Um, and it's a pretty little pattern of stars in the sky that you can see in the late spring and in the summer. It's right between um, Arcturus and Hercules. Uh, the brightest star in uh, uh, Corona Borealis is called Gemma, so it's the gem in the crown. Uh, it's a very pretty star. It's actually a binary star, so you can see it with, uh, as you zoom in on it with a telescope. Um, and there's a very important star over in this part of the constellation that's, um, let's see, I don't have it labeled on here. Uh, it's right in this area and it's called R Corona Borealis. So that's actually a variable star. It's a star that changes in brightness. It's a very interesting star because it stays more or less the same brightness and then every so often it gets really dim. Uh, so it's kind of like a reverse 
nova or reverse bursting star. Uh, there are some stars that get bright and fade and bright and fade with a regular period. And uh, our core bore, as they say, uh, our corona borealis, um, is one of these stars that goes through an outburst of dust, dust expulsion. So it's a yellow supergiant star, and it's near the end of its lifespan. And every so often, it dims dramatically when it goes through one of these dust outbursts. I think this happened most recently two or three years ago. And so you can look for it with your naked eye and see it and know, OK, it hasn't dimmed recently. And then every so often, it'll just disappear. Uh, actually, kind of like uh, Betelgeuse was doing this past winter. So uh, amateur astronomers probably heard about how Betelgeuse was dimming surprisingly this past winter. Uh, people were speculating, oh, maybe it's about to go supernova. Uh, well, no, probably not. And it's actually gotten uh, <laughs> back to its normal brightness now. Um, but uh, this is an interesting star to monitor because it has that unusual signature of getting dim uh, all of a sudden. Um, I'm actually very interested in double or variable stars. I think they're interesting to study. They make for very interesting uh, teaching uh, objects uh, to talk about stellar evolution and how stars change over time and so forth. You think the stars are uh, always have constant brightness and that, yes, yeah, sure, they change over millions of years, but you would never notice that as a human looking at the sky for a few decades. You'd never notice that, but you can actually see stars that change uh, in brightness um, over a few days uh, even, and then some that change over much longer periods of time. Okay, um, let's see, were there any other star patterns I wanted to point out over in this direction? You know, later in the evening and getting later in the summer, we're gonna be able to see uh, the constellation of Hercules. It's not a very bright uh, constellation, but you can certainly see the four bright stars here that kind of make up his body. So um, amateur astronomers call this the keystone asterism, this kind of pattern here that looks a little bit like the keystone of a bridge, right? Um, so these four stars are right next to um, Corona Borealis and Bootes, and that um, globular star cluster that I mentioned last time, M13, is right here. I think of it as being sort of uh, right underneath his arm right there. So he's holding up his arm like so, and he's got a, he's got a star cluster there in his armpit. Uh, very bright star cluster, easy to see with binoculars. Well, not, not hard to see with binoculars, <laughs> but it looks great through a medium-sized or a small uh, telescope. So a good first target or one of your first targets to look for. Okay, uh, let me talk a little bit about astronomy news. Oh, let me see if we have any questions. Feel free to post a question in the um, YouTube live chat if anyone has any questions about the constellations that are up or the deep sky objects that are up uh, or anything like that that I haven't gotten to yet. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Venus because I mentioned that we're gonna, we need to say goodbye to Venus. So uh, a toast, uh, a sip of coffee for Venus. You were beautiful uh, all winter. And now Venus is heading between us and the sun. So we'll lose it in conjunction with the sun and then we'll see it again as a morning star. So let me go back in time and find Venus for you. Okay. Now, I really want to see how Venus is moving relative to the sun. So I'm going to do something a little bit unusual. I'm going to go back to when the sun is above the horizon. And I'm going to hide the constellation lines. And I'm going to turn off the atmosphere, which would allow me to see the stars during the day. So here are the stars and planets I would be able to see during the day. So you can see the sun is actually very close to um, the Pleiades star cluster, this very, um, also a very pretty little star cluster that you can see in the fall um, and the winter. But you can't see it right now because it's right in line with the sun. So you'd have to wait uh, a month or so for you in order to be able to see it in the morning sky as the sun appears to move around the zodiac relative to the earth as we orbit around the sun. Anyway, uh, there we see Venus, there we see Mercury. So where is Venus in its orbit? Right, I'm gonna click on Venus and I'm gonna turn on a line that represents the orbit of Venus. So there you see the orbit of Venus where it would appear in the sky. And if I were to go forward a few days, you can see, there goes the moon, but you can see how Venus is appearing to get closer to the sun in the sky. If I were to go back a few days, you see how Venus is getting apparently further away from the sun in the sky. Now, if we go back to uh, 
you know, early April or so, Venus was very high in the sky, way up here, kind of at the edge of as, uh, where we can see its orbit uh, as seen from the Earth as it goes around the Sun. So what's going on here, of course, is that Venus is orbiting in nearly a circle, circle around the Sun, and the Earth is orbiting in nearly a circle uh, around the Sun outside the orbit of Venus. So when we look at the orbit of Venus, where it would be in the sky, it looks like this ring around the Sun up there in the sky. So that's what I'm seeing here in the simulator. And as I go forward in time, Venus appears to move in line with the Sun. And it happens quite quickly, right? So we're now at the end of May. And there it's in line with the Sun on June 3rd. That's when we have a conjunction of Venus with the Sun. And then Venus is going to move over to the other side of the Sun. Right? So I'll zoom back out a little bit. Venus is on the other side of the Sun. So if we wanted to see Venus in our sky, we would have to look for it at sunrise. Just before sunrise, Venus is going to come up above the horizon, and we see it now as the morning star. Right? So we have been seeing it as the evening star, but after June 3rd, or a week or two after June 3rd, so it gets far enough away from the sun, you would be able to see it as the morning star. And I'll show you that um, here in a minute. Uh, morning is the best time right now to actually look for the other naked eye planets, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Now Mercury is uh, coming around the front of the Sun and heading for a point where we could potentially see it as an evening star, so in the west just after sunset. Let me turn off the orbit of Venus and show you Mercury. Right. Mercury has a smaller orbit, it's closer to the Sun, so when we look at Venus in the sky versus Mercury, Mercury has um, Mercury in the sky versus Venus, uh, Mercury has a smaller orbit as seen from the Earth, and so that's not surprising. Uh, there's Mercury, and look where it is in its orbit. If we go forward a few days, by the way, there goes the crescent moon. Um, if we go forward a few days, there it is at what we call maximum angle, maximum elongation to the Sun. So this is happening on also June 3rd, and so if we go to sunset, like so, you have the chance to see Mercury low in the, in the west right at sunset. This should be on uh, every amateur astronomer's bucket list, right, to see all of the naked eye planets. Uh, so there are uh, six naked eye planets, right? So we've got Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and number six is the one that I can see right now. That's the Earth. You can see the Earth with your naked eye just looking down. Um, it's actually uh, possible to see the planet Uranus with the naked eye under very favorable conditions. When the Earth is closest to Uranus and when the sky is really dark, it is technically possible to see Uranus with the naked eye, but uh, it was discovered with a telescope, so we don't call it a naked eye planet. Um, oh, oh uh, someone's asking which way is retrograde. I'm just about to talk about that. So if you don't know anything about astrology, uh, you probably know your sun sign, right? So your sun sign is not the constellation, but the sign that the sun is in on the day you're born. And it starts with the sun in Aries on the spring equinox, and the, every 30 days there's a new sign. Um, it used to line up with the constellations 3,000 years ago, but it doesn't line up with the constellations anymore. I could talk about, the, I don't really have time to talk about that now, but I could talk about that um, at another time if people are interested. So the other thing that people often hear about with regards to astrology is that Mercury is retrograde. Whoa! Uh, does that mean that uh, uh, Mercury has uh, uh, backwards ideas about politics? That it's going to go, <laughs> they're trying to take away votes from people? Uh, <laughs> does it have ideas that are out of date? Um, well, maybe. But what retrograde means is that the planet appears to move opposite the direction of the Sun. Uh, opposite the direction of the Sun. Now this is easier to see with what we call the superior planets, the planets that are orbiting outside the orbit of the Earth, so Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn in terms of the naked eye planets. So let me show you Mars and how Mars appears to move relative to the stars. So let's find Mars. So we need to spin around over here in the east and we're going to go later in the evening so that Things rise, and there's Jupiter, and then there's Saturn. You know, maybe I should actually do this with, with uh, 
with Jupiter because Jupiter is closer to uh, retrograde. So I'll do this with Jupiter actually. So let's watch Jupiter here. And does Jupiter move around relative to the stars? By the way, Jupiter and Saturn are going to be close to each other in the sky uh, later this summer in July and August. And it'll be a really nice sight um, uh, to see in the sky with your naked eye. And I think it's very unlikely we'll have, in fact, I'm sure we won't have the observatory open to the public on Tuesdays in June and July, or in July and August. Uh, we're gonna be doing our summer program for our high school students remotely. So uh, everyone's gonna be working on that. <laughs> so uh, still try to do the live stream so you can see these planets through the telescopes on uh, Tuesday nights when it's clear, but go out and look for, with your own eyes as well. Anyway, let's see how Jupiter moves relative to the stars. So over the course of a night, of course, you know, the planets and the stars all appear to move to the west. They rise in the east, get high in the sky, set in the west, just like the sun and the moon do. So I, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is night after night, are the planet, there goes the moon, <laughs> are the planets moving relative to the stars. So what I'm doing here is I'm using a keyboard uh, shortcut to move the simulator ahead one day. So here I am, June 30th. I'll bring up the, uh, the window that shows the dates so you can, you can follow here. And um, let's go ahead. Do you see how Jupiter is appearing to move? And Saturn also is appearing to move relative to the stars. Notice how the moon is moving every time the moon comes by. So the moon, every, there goes the moon. So there's the moon moving around relative to the ecliptic, relative to the background stars. It appears to go from right to left. And that's the same direction that the sun appears to move relative to the stars. So if we were to go look at the sun right now, there's the sun. And let's zoom in here on the sun. Of course, we can't see the stars near the sun unless there's a total solar eclipse. But if we look night after night, the sun relative to the stars appears to be moving. Now I'm tracking the sun, so you don't see it actually moving. Let me stop tracking. So uh, day after day, the sun appears to move sort of from right to left, if you've got the North Pole sort of over your head. Astronomers, we say that it moves to the east. It's moving apparently from west to east relative to the stars. But if you're looking at the sky, it appears to move from right to left. So there goes the sun. And if we were to see the moon, it also appears to move from right to left. Okay, well, let's go back and look at um, Jupiter and Saturn. So I'm gonna zoom in here on Jupiter. If you zoom in enough, of course, I can see the moons. These are some of my favorite things to look at through uh, a small telescope are the Galilean moons discovered by Jupiter. And there you can see the cloud bands on Jupiter as well. But we're doing, we're doing naked eye astronomy today, so let's, let's zoom back out. <laughs> um, and I wanna see how is Jupiter moving relative to the star. So here we go, we're gonna keep, keep going. Okay, Jupiter appears to move from left to right. Oh, wait, wait, oh, nope, oh, it's going from right to left. There goes the moon again. Okay, okay, so Jupiter moves from, oh, there goes the moon again. Every time the moon goes by, that's one month, of course. Uh, Jupiter appears to move from right to left along the ecliptic, along the plane of the solar system. So, okay, that's fine. Now, I think Jupiter was moving differently before. I thought I saw Jupiter doing something different. Um, let me go back in time. I'm already uh, November 9th, 2020. That's after the election, right? Um, so uh, anyway, let's go, let me go back to uh, now. So I'm gonna go back to May, okay. And you know, we could go to tonight, it doesn't really matter. Um, and I'm gonna find Jupiter again. Let me find Jupiter in the sky. I've got kind of a crazy, okay, there we go. There's Jupiter. And let's zoom in on a little bit. As long as I've got this orientation, I'm gonna change the orientation a little bit so that it doesn't keep uh, flipping around on me here. I'm gonna do this, there we go. Okay, so uh, night after night, what does Jupiter do? Let's see. Okay, uh, oh, wait a minute, Jupiter is moving, there goes the moon. Jupiter's moving left to right. Okay, I'm just gonna let time go. Oh, no, it's moving right to left. Okay, there goes the sun. Let's keep, let's keep watching Jupiter. 
right to left, right to left, right to left, right to left. Oh my, Jupiter stopped and went backwards. Okay, so when Jupiter was going in the same direction as the sun and the moon, we call that prograde motion. When Jupiter was going opposite the sun and the moon, we call that retrograde motion. And ancient astronomers called it retrograde motion because um, it appeared to be contrary to the natural motion of celestial objects. And you have to remember that um, before uh, uh, the time of Copernicus, or really the time of Newton, most astronomers, most everyone, thought that the Earth was the center of the universe and the, planet and the planets and the sun and the moon all went around the Earth. So if Jupiter is going around the Earth, why would it, about once a year, stop and go backwards and then go forwards again? And this is a famous problem in the history of astronomy. How do you explain that backwards motion? And the problem, the answer that, uh, uh, you know, the, the answer that astronomers came up with um, was that uh, this idea of epicycles. So let me show you that here. I'm going to try to switch over to my browser so I can show you a simulation. Okay. Here's the Stellarium website, by the way. So this is the simulator I've been using, um, and uh, you can download it for free. I actually recently discovered you can also get it on your phone. So uh, you can um, pay, it's not free on your phone, I think it's uh, $3 or so uh, on the uh, Apple uh, uh, App Store. But uh, you can get this on your phone, you can get this on your computer for free, um, and it's a very nice app to use. Um, but I wanted to show you the solution that astronomers came up with. So this is the model with the Earth at the center. The Earth is right there. The yellow sphere is the sun. And if I run this simulation, you can see that the Earth appears to go that way, and then it goes backwards, and then it goes that way. I, this is Jupiter, not the Earth. The, the planet Jupiter is at point P. There it goes backwards. There it goes forwards. Forwards is the same direction as the sun. So as seen from above the Earth, the sun is going counterclockwise around the Earth. And this is a model. This is a theory for how the planets would appear to move that explains how the planets appear to move that was the dominant model in astronomy from the time of Hipparchus around uh, 50 or so BC to the time of Copernicus or a little bit past that, uh, past that around uh, uh, 50, or sort of uh, mid-1500s or so. Uh, even in the time of Galileo, kind of early 1600s, this really, not everyone had accepted the Copernican model with the sun at the center uh, of the solar system. So retrograde motion is uh, a little bit uh, sinister. <laughs> um, it's a little bit against the natural order in an old geocentric cosmology. So when Mercury is going retrograde, that means that Mercury appears to move backwards relative to the stars. The same with Venus. When Venus is going retrograde, it appears to move backwards relative to the stars. And I can show you that. Let me show you that. Um, before I go back to the simulator, though, there is one other thing I wanted to show you um, in the browser here before we go on. As Venus goes between the Earth and the Sun, its phase change, it changes. We could actually see that if you go back and look at the live streams from uh, last week and then three weeks ago, we were looking at Venus um, at the end of April and it was a little bit smaller and a little bit more illuminated. And then last week, which is basically similar to this photo on the left, um, it's bigger, it appears bigger in the sky because it's closer to us and it's less illuminated. Uh, it's sort of more of a thin crescent. And then here on Monday, you can see it's a very thin crescent. And when we get to June 3rd, it's essentially going to be an invisible crescent. You won't be able to see it because it'll be in line with the sun, but that's when it will be as minimum uh, lit. Uh, from, we'll, we'll be able to see the smallest amount of illumination from the clouds, the reflective clouds of Venus. Something else I mentioned before when we were looking at Venus, when you, when you look at Venus through a telescope, you can't see any surface details like you can on Jupiter or Mars because Venus is enshrouded in a dense layer of clouds, which you'll see in the Planetarium show um, here in a minute. But let me switch back to the simulator and show you something. Okay, so now I've got the simulator uh, open and I want to go back again to right now, tonight. Okay, and I want to find the planet Venus. Okay, so there's Venus. 
And if I show you the orbit again, you see, okay, well, it's heading around to move between us and the sun. Um, so how is Venus moving relative to the stars? Let's watch. So if I, again, go for it a day at a time, looks like it's moving to the left. Oh, wait, I, something's wrong here because I'm on May 19th, 2021 in the distant future. Let's go back to 2020. Ah, so Venus is up on this side of the orbit. Okay, that makes sense. All right, how is Venus moving relative to the stars? Watch that star and that star and those stars. And let's see what happens here. Venus was moving sort of from left to right and down a little bit. Venus is retrograde right now. And this is what happens when either Mercury or Venus goes between us and the sun. It kind of makes sense, right? Uh, imagine you're jogging around a track and there's something at the center of the track that's not moving, that's the sun. You're the Earth. Um, another jogger who's faster than you is going, is, is going past you on an inside track. So from your point of view, you're moving along, they're moving along, they go past you. It looks like they're moving from left to right. <laughs> it looks like they're moving kind of the opposite way that the center of the track is moving relative to your motion. So uh, it kind of makes sense. So Venus is going retrograde. And Mercury does this as well. Now Venus goes retrograde only uh, once every 500 and something days. So Venus retrograde is less common than Mercury retrograde. Let's see when Mercury goes retrograde. So let's go, Mercury is moving from right to left relative to the stars. Ignore the sun for the moment. Le right to left, right to left, right to left, right to left. Okay, right about there. Aha, it's making a loop down and it's going backwards. So Mercury is retrograde for that period of about a week and a half or so. So beware. <laughs> There's this old idea that, that when Mercury is retrograde, bad things happen. Uh, electronics break down, computers stop working properly and so forth. Uh, no evidence this works and you wouldn't, ex no, no evidence that ever happens and you wouldn't expect it to happen, right? <laughs> Mercury is not sending out emanating rays when it goes retrograde. But uh, this is a real astronomical event when a planet goes retrograde. For Mercury and Venus, it happens when they go between us and the sun. For Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars, it happens when we go between that planet and the sun. So when Mars or Jupiter or Saturn are opposite the sun in the sky. That's also when they're brightest because that's when the Earth is closest to those planets. Okay, uh, so I wanna talk about that because I saw <laughs> people saying that Venus is going retrograde and I wanted to, I wanted to explain uh, what that means. Okay, um, one other bit of astronomy news I wanted to talk about before um, moving on. Uh, last time I talked about this potentially naked eye comet, Comet Swan. So let me give you an update on Comet Swan. Okay. Well, uh, I was looking at the orbit again. Here's the orbit again. And actually, by the way, this is a current representation of the orbits of the object in the inner solar system. So you can see where Earth is and Venus, and Venus is about to go right between uh, the Earth and the Sun. And then Mercury is coming around on the other side. If you look at an orbit diagram like this that shows where the planets are in the solar system, if you kind of look at the line, this is a 3D uh, simulation of the inner solar system that's on the JPL, the NASA JPL website. Um, if I look at a line that goes from the Earth to the Sun, anything on the left side of the line I would see in the evening sky, and anything on the right side of the sky I would see in the morning sky, and anything in the opposite direction are things that I would see at midnight. Right? So the Earth is, is turning counterclockwise and it's orbiting counterclockwise around the solar system and so you can figure out where things are relative to the Sun and that tells you when the best time is to look for them in the sky. Um, so there is Comet Swan right there. So you can see, um, I can center right there. It's high above the plane of the solar system. So where would you look for it in the sky? Well, remember this line from the Earth to the Sun uh, tells you where to look for it. It's still a little bit to the right of that line. So it would still be best to look for it in the early morning sky. And some of the astronomy news sites uh, that I've been looking at to keep track of this have suggested looking for it this week before sunrise. Um, but it's gonna be very hard to see. 
um, I found this uh, plot of where the comet is moving relative to the stars in Sky and Telescope. And so you can see here it is May 7th. Let's go to today, May 19th. There it is right there. Now the sun, I showed you where the sun was in the simulator. The sun is right over here, right next to the Pleiades star cluster. The tail of the comet always points away from the sun because it's the solar wind that's pushing the gas and dust away and making the tail appear to move. Um, so the comet will be here tonight and then there tomorrow. Um, you know, it's going to be tough to see. It's going to be very low in the sky at sunrise, and it's not visible to the naked eye. You'd have to look with binoculars. But you could try it if it's clear uh, tomorrow morning. Now, let's look at the weather forecast. <laughs> Don't think it's going to be clear tomorrow morning. That's not the forecast for now. Maybe clear tomorrow night. That's, the, that's interesting. Um, Thursday morning might be clear. So Thursday morning is what? Um, uh, the 21st of May. So it would be right next to this bright star in the constellation of Perseus. So if you're an early riser, if you, you, know, you like to get up at uh, 5 a.m. and walk outside, and you have a very clear view of the east horizon, and you've got a pair of binoculars, it might be worth giving it a shot. Um, go out and find this uh, star in Perseus, Beta Persei. You can find it using Stellarium or a star, star chart or something like that. And the comet should be just a little bit to the left of that bright star. Now, I think uh, it's a better idea to look for it later when it's up in the evening sky, and that's what I plan to do. So um, again, if we go back to the simulator here, and if we go, or the 3D plotted orbit, and let's go forward in time here, there you see the comet going up high above the sun, and it reaches um, its closest approach. I think closest approach is technically right in here. I think it's May 26th, right? So that's when it's going to be closest to the sun. And actually, that's when you'd expect it to be brightest in terms of having the longest tail and the biggest, brightest uh, coma. Now, if we look at where it is relative to the line of the sun, it's now a little bit to the left of the sun. So we, we would look for it in the evening sky, low in the west, right after sunset. It's going to be hard to see. Uh, <laughs> so if we look, this is May 29th. And if we look at the map here, it's sort of over here near the bright star Capella. So it really helps when this faint comet is close to a bright star because you can find the bright star in your binoculars and then move a little bit to the right or left or up or down or whatever you need to and potentially find that comet. Um, I think people are saying uh, go look at it now in the morning sky because they're afraid that it's going to fade or break apart like Comet Atlas did. So look for it now when we know it's bright enough to see with binoculars, but it actually should be a little bit brighter at the end of May. And so that's when I'm going to need to, <laughs> that's when I plan to try to look for it. All right, let me see if I have any questions. Okay, so um, I am going to start the planetarium show. So let me get rid of my video. And this is a planetarium show, which if you've been to the Leitner Observatory for um, a public show uh, anytime recently, you may have seen this one. This is one of my favorite planetarium shows. It's called Dynamic Earth. And it's about the Earth's climate and how the Earth is similar to and different from Venus. Um, a little bit about the carbon cycle, how life affects the Earth's climate. So it's gonna run for about, um, let's see, uh, 20 something minutes. And let me actually, Get it started here. Um, and uh, as I said uh, with the uh, other uh, planetarium shows that I showed from Spitz, this is a demo show that they've made uh, available to us for uh, quarantine, lockdown, not letting the public into your planetarium. We can actually show these planetarium shows. But you will see a watermark crawl across the screen. So you'll see preview only um, a couple of times during the show. OK, enjoy. Imagine the Earth is a machine, 
a system of cogs and motors, powered by the sun. But our world didn't come with an owner's manual. How does it operate? What are the inner workings of this grand and elaborate system known as planet Earth? And why is it so conducive to life? Scientists have launched an armada of satellites to help us understand what makes our world tick. They are discovering the answers strewn across its atmosphere, on every ocean and continent, in the far reaches of the solar system and beyond. Like any machine, the Earth is the sum of its parts. They were forged in distant furnaces of our galaxy. Supernova explosions. When ancient stars erupted, they showered the Milky Way with heavy elements, iron, calcium, potassium, the very stuff our bodies are made of. But supernovae are also thought to bombard the galaxy with lethal, high-energy particles. What safeguards our solar system is our star. The sun provides a shield, stretching beyond the last planet in its orbit, a force field that deflects these cosmic rays. But these solar winds can be dangerous too, especially during outbursts called coronal mass ejections. Want a vision of Earth gone wrong? Just look at what solar storms do to our sister planet, Venus. They strip away lighter elements in its upper atmosphere. Hydrogen, oxygen, and the molecule they form, water. What's left is a witch's brew of noxious chemicals, including thick sulfurous clouds. Down at the surface, Venus's atmosphere is choked with high concentrations of carbon dioxide. CO2 is a potent greenhouse gas that traps the sun's heat. It has turned Venus into a cauldron. With surface temperatures at almost 500 degrees Celsius, this is the hottest planet in the solar system. How has Earth avoided the grim fate of Venus? We can see the answer as the solar storm approaches Earth. Our planet has a protective shield all its own, a powerful magnetic field generated deep within its core. In fact, that's just our first line of defense. Much of the solar energy that gets through is reflected back to space by clouds, ice, and snow. 
The energy that Earth absorbs is just enough to power a remarkable planetary engine, the climate. It's set in motion by the unevenness of solar heating, due in part to the cycles of day and night and the seasons, that causes warm tropical winds to blow toward the poles and cold polar air toward the equator. Wind currents drive surface ocean currents. This computer simulation shows the Gulf Stream winding its way along the coast of North America. This great ocean river carries enough heat energy to power the industrial world a hundred times over. It breaks down in massive whirlpools that spread warm tropical waters over northern seas. Below the surface, they mix with cold, deep currents that swirl around undersea ledges and mountains. Earth's climate engine has countless moving parts, tides and terrain, crosswinds and currents all working to equalize temperatures around the globe. But when tropical heat builds to extremes, it can be released in a fury. In August 2005, within a huge looping section of the Gulf Stream, the ocean unleashed a monster. Hurricane Katrina. This is a supercomputer model of Katrina, a tool for scientists to better understand the dynamics of the hurricane system. To visualize the flow of air into the storm, they release a series of virtual streamers Those with lighter colors are warmer winds. As they rise, they collide with cooler air above and produce clouds. The winds increase the evaporation of warm seawater which draws more and more heat from the ocean and causes the winds to accelerate. Moving around the eye of the storm, winds can reach speeds of up to 250 kilometers per hour. A powerful hurricane like Katrina can release as much heat energy every 20 minutes as a 10 megaton nuclear bomb. While storms release heat stored in the ocean, the moisture they stir into the atmosphere helps keep the rest of the planet warm. Water vapor traps solar energy, along with carbon dioxide, the same greenhouse gas that ruined Venus. The difference is that Earth has found a way to keep CO2 in check. We can see it for ourselves by flying down to the ocean.
The special ingredient that sets Earth apart is called life. The oceans are chock full of it. Too small for our eyes to see, phytoplankton may be the most important living things on the planet. They take in CO2, driven into the ocean by waves or drawn up from the deep by currents. They release the oxygen while absorbing carbon. The carbon then begins a journey up the food chain. Phytoplankton get eaten by zooplankton. To name a few, radiolarians date back to a time over 500 million years ago when life exploded across Earth's oceans. Copepods are tiny bug-like crustaceans. With over 20,000 species, they are the single largest source of protein in the sea. Moving up in scale is a host of creatures smaller than the tip of your finger, including these octopus larvae. They get eaten by small fish. And they, in turn, by larger ones, like jacks. They are consumed by the largest predators in the sea. Orcas. Tuna. Sharks. At each step in the food chain, the carbon that began as part of a diffuse gas in the air is passed on to larger and larger animals. The larger the body, the greater the mass of carbon. One creature goes all out. A humpback whale eats up to a ton and a half of food per day. That's a lot of carbon. From whales down to tiny phytoplankton, marine life is part of a global system of removing CO2 from the atmosphere, then gradually releasing it back. The key to this carbon cycle is Earth's ability to store it long term. A NASA satellite tuned to read chlorophyll a chemical tracer for plant growth shows the global biosphere in action. In sync with the seasons, plants take in vast amounts of carbon dioxide and release the oxygen we breathe. On land, the carbon can then find its way into the ground when plants and animals die and decay. The earth, too, gets into the act. Exposed rocks take in CO2 when it rains. Erosion sends it into the oceans. If it becomes part of the marine food chain, carbon-rich matter can sink all the way to the sea bottom in the form of waste. Countless organisms, like the salp, 
a jellyfish-like creature the size of your thumb, live and die each year. All the waste, all those bodies with their stores of carbon, rain down onto the ocean floor. They pile up, layer upon layer. In time, these carbon-rich sediments can turn to oil or to rock, like limestone. The carbon can return to the environment as CO2 if the rocks become exposed, or if they get pushed deep underground by the movement of the Earth's crust, in a process known as plate tectonics. The pressure and heat gradually build until the Earth begins to erupt. Every year, over 100 million tons of carbon dioxide is spewed into the oceans and atmosphere by volcanoes. Acting on time scales of a day to millions of years, the carbon cycle has helped make our planet habitable. But its success depends on life itself. We are how Earth works. If somehow the carbon cycle went wrong, what would Earth be like? The answer is a world away, on Venus. Here, the CO2 belching from volcanoes isn't going anywhere. Venus is like a house on fire with the windows forever closed. The cause can be traced in part to those incinerating solar winds. Sheltered from those winds, Earth has kept CO2 levels in balance by absorbing and releasing it in roughly equal amounts. Lately, that balance has been shifting. The amount of carbon dioxide from human activities, including cars, power plants, and factories, now exceeds volcanoes by over 200 times. Much of that is from the burning of oil and coal stored in the earth for millions of years. Since the Industrial Revolution, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has increased nearly 40%, with most of that in the last 50 years. The result? Global temperatures have risen by almost one degree Celsius. That's enough to accelerate the melting of vast stores of ice on high mountains and in polar regions. Since the 1980s, NASA scientists have methodically tracked the Arctic seasonal changes. They have found it's lost a quarter of the area covered by ice in summer. What's left has also thinned dramatically. That's just the beginning of changes that could transform our world. With some regions getting more rainfall, others drought. Deserts expanding. Natural fires becoming more prevalent. Wildlife habitat shrinking. Polar regions becoming forested. And as the ice melts, it drains into the oceans. By the end of the century, sea levels are now expected to rise as much as one winter, inundating coastlines around the world.
as our impact on the climate has grown, we've also gained a new perspective on Earth. From space. Technology is allowing us to take stock of the elaborate interconnected climate systems that protect our world and sustain it. Within the fold of wind and water, of time and tectonics, our planet has nurtured another extraordinary participant, life. Today, we are masters of a world revealing itself as more and more wondrous than we ever imagined. Even as we continue to explore its workings, we ask, is our goal to spend Earth or save it? Okay, <laughs> I really like this show. I, it looks really great on the dome. Let me uh, bring this down. I think the uh, the baby octopuses are very cute. And I feel like uh, in the um, underwater sequences, uh, really, really, you really um, uh, feel like you're underwater. <laughs> All right, I'm going to switch over to the uh, observing deck camera again. And hopefully you can hear me. I hope I fixed my audio. Hello, hello. hello. I uh, heard a um, statistic uh, on a uh, podcast about uh, how the economic slowdown uh, might affect uh, carbon, carbon emissions, emissions and, and uh, climate, climate change and things like that. that. And uh, there was a projection that carbon emissions should be down about 8% this year. Global carbon emissions should be down about 8%, which doesn't seem like a lot. Uh, uh, of course, a lot of the um, a lot of the economy is still going, but there's this big uh, decrease in travel. A lot of factories are closed uh, and so forth. Um, uh, but, but the, the thing that's interesting, interesting was that uh, some scientists say that, say that this is exactly the amount of reduction in carbon emissions that we need to reduce global warming to acceptable values, the things that we can adapt to. <laughs> this is not the way to do it. <laughs> Having a global pandemic and shutting down uh, travel and factories and, and so forth. Uh, not the way we should do it. Uh, but, you know. Who knows what uh, science and engineering and the world's going to be like uh, once we figure all this out and we can start getting back to back to normal and getting the economy rolling again. But uh, we'll have some new ideas and uh, can still continue to reduce carbon emissions. Anyway, uh, let's see if there are any uh, questions about the show. I uh, look like I'm out on the observing deck right now. This is the live camera view from the observing deck at the Lightner Observatory, but I'm not. Uh, I'm just in front of a green screen. I'm showing myself in front of the, the camera. It's uh, gotten dark out there, so you can see the, the infrared camera is showing the, the view on the deck. Uh, still cloudy, though. In fact, I see... Uh, no, I don't see any rain. I just see clouds. I see uh, bugs flying by the lens <laughs> occasionally. Uh, virtual conferences forever. Oh, please, no. <laughs> Not until we have, like, really good VR helmets or glasses or something so that I can, you know, look people in the eye. I have to remember when I'm teaching to look at the camera, to look my students in the eye, but then I don't get the same 
connection that I get when I'm teaching in person because the, the, the eye just stares at me. The camera lens just stares at me. <laughs> Uh, any, any questions, questions about the show, show or any uh, questions, questions about any other astronomy, any other astronomy topics? Uh, like I said, it looks like it's going to be clear Wednesday night, tomorrow night. Uh, go outside when it's dark. Um, I didn't show the moon in my presentation. Uh, the moon is very close to new moon right now. So we're getting uh, close to the end of Ramadan, right? So uh, the lunar month turns over with the new moon. Um, and we'll have the end of uh, the month of Ramadan in the, in the Islamic calendar. Um, and so the moon, you would see the moon in the early morning sky. If you were to get up uh, Thursday morning uh, to look for the comet uh, very low in the east, you, you would see a, a very old, very thin crescent moon um, as well over in that direction. Okay, well, thanks everyone for your attention. I think I'll sign off. Um, uh, if, if anyone has any questions, questions you can email us. Uh, the uh, email account for the observatory is info at lightnerobservatory.org. The website is lightnerobservatory.yale.edu. And that's where things, updates will be posted, um, the link to the live stream and so forth. Um, and my email is michael.fason, uh, F-A-I-S-O-N, at yale.edu. And I appreciate people who come and watch this stream live and people who watch it later. Um, I will post uh, the link to this uh, SPITS preview of Dynamic Earth in the description. So if you want to watch it again, um, you can do that. And links to any of the things that I talked about, I'll post that in the description as well. Um, otherwise, I'll see you again next Tuesday. Have a great week, everyone. Clear skies.